For half a century, armor was the soul of the warship. Guns decided range and firepower, but armor decided survival. Naval designers believed that if steel could stop shells, then more steel meant victory. This belief shaped fleets, budgets, and entire empires. Today, we are talking about the evolution of naval armor. From the first ironclads to the face-hardened steel of the dreadnoughts, armor became a science of angles, thickness, and survival. It often determined how ships were built, how battles were fought, and how long crews lived when the guns started firing. Yet by the middle of the Second World War, the most heavily armored warships ever constructed were being sunk faster than their predecessors. Not because the armor failed, but because war had changed. This is not a story about bad design or wasted steel. It is the story of how naval armor reached the limits of what physics and metallurgy could offer, and how air power and underwater weapons had finally overcome it. Naval armor began as a direct response to a brutal truth. Wooden warships could no longer survive explosive shells. In the late 19th century, the first ironclads appeared. Ships like HMS Warrior and USS Monitor shocked the world. For the first time, warships could absorb punishment that would have destroyed any wooden ship. USS Monitor introduced the rotating armored turret, proving that protection and firepower could be concentrated rather than spread across a hull. HMS Warrior combined iron armor with steam power and long range, making her the most powerful warship of her era. Other nations followed quickly. France launched Gloire, the first ocean-going ironclad. Iron-armored fleets replaced wooden battle lines almost overnight. These early ironclads were slow, cramped, and mechanically unreliable, but they proved a decisive point that armor worked. However, iron armor was heavy and inefficient. Ships could only carry so much of it before speed and stability suffered. Designers needed stronger protection without unbearable weight. That need led directly to steel armor, and eventually to the first true breakthrough. In the 1890s, Harvey armor transformed protection at sea. By hardening the face of steel plates through carbon infusion, Harvey armor offered significantly better resistance without dramatically increasing thickness. For the first time, navies could improve protection without simply piling on more steel and weight. This allowed ships to protect vital areas more effectively. Their armor could defeat contemporary shells at expected battle ranges, giving navies confidence in armored battle lines and traditional fleet engagements. Despite these advances, armor was often still unevenly applied. Belts protected machinery and magazines, but bow and stern sections remained vulnerable. Gun positions were heavily armored, but decks were thin and lightly protected. This created a dangerous illusion. Battleships appeared heavily protected, yet a lucky hit in an unarmored section could still cripple most of these ships. Designers understood that simply improving armor quality was not enough. Protection needed to be stronger, more efficient, and more intelligently designed. Harvey armor was a major step forward, but it was not the final answer. It prepared the way for something even better. Similar to Harvey armor, but with a deeper hardened face and a better transition layer. And despite the name, Krupp cemented armor did not contain cement, only very advanced steel. Krupp cemented armor changed naval warfare at the exact moment battleships were becoming dominant. Developed in Germany around the 1890s, Krupp armor proved so effective that rival navies had little choice but to adopt it. Great Britain, the world's leading naval power, licensed the process and began using Krupp cemented armor in its capital ships. The Royal Navy understood that armor quality mattered as much as gun caliber. When HMS Dreadnought entered service in 1906, she carried Krupp cemented armor as part of a carefully balanced protection scheme. This was not just an upgrade. It was a statement. The world's most powerful navy had accepted that future battleships required the best metallurgy available. Other nations followed quickly. Germany refined the process even more. The United States adopted Krupp-style armor under license too. Japan initially just imported plates, 
but later even developed multiple versions. Krupp cemented armor became the global standard. This armor allowed dreadnoughts to carry thicker belts and turret faces without becoming impossibly heavy. It made the all-big gun battleship practical to build. Without Krupp armor, dreadnoughts would have been slower, smaller, or far less protected. But this success carried a consequence. As armor improved, guns grew larger to defeat it. As guns grew larger, armor grew thicker again. The dreadnought era became an arms race of steel and firepower, where no advantage lasted for long. By the First World War, Krupp cemented armor defined what a modern battleship was. It did not make ships invulnerable, but it pushed protection to the highest level steel could achieve at the time. As battleships grew larger, designers faced an unavoidable truth. They could not armor everything on the ship. The solution was the all-or-nothing scheme. Instead of spreading medium-thickness armor across the entire hull, designers concentrated the thickest armor around vital areas such as magazines and machinery. Everything else was left lightly protected or completely unarmored. The United States Navy perfected this concept. Ships like USS Nevada and later classes were designed so that anything essential to survival and combat was heavily protected, while non-essential areas were considered expendable. This worked well against shells fired at typical battle ranges. If a shell struck outside the armored citadel, damage could often be absorbed. If it struck inside, armor was expected to stop it. At least, that was the theory. As gun ranges increased, shells no longer struck ships on a flat trajectory. They began to fall into decks, known as plunging fire, where shells struck decks rather than belts. Designers responded by thickening deck armor, especially over magazines and machinery spaces. However, deck armor faced severe limits. Thick horizontal armor raised a ship's center of gravity and reduced its stability. There was only so much steel a hull could safely carry. At the same time, shells became more sophisticated. Delayed action fuses allowed shells to penetrate decks before exploding deep inside a ship. Armor schemes grew increasingly complex, layered, and heavy. Battleships were now being designed for a specific kind of gun battle that was already becoming less common. Armor was optimized to stop shells. However bombs and torpedoes ignored those rules entirely. Aerial bombs attacked from steep angles, striking decks with forces far greater than most artillery shells. Torpedoes attack below the waterline, where even the thickest belts could not fully protect against the sheer explosive shock and overwhelming flooding. Navies responded with torpedo bulges, internal voids, and layered underwater protection systems. These worked to a point, but every improvement added weight and further complexity. Aircraft improved faster than armor. Bomb loads increased, torpedoes became more reliable, armor thickness could not increase indefinitely. Battleships were now facing threats they had never been designed to defeat. The final verdict came not from theory, but from events. At Taranto, slow and lightly armed biplanes crippled Italy's battleships using torpedoes. At Pearl Harbor, heavily armored American battleships were sunk or disabled by bombs and torpedoes delivered from the air. At Midway, battleships played almost no role at all. Aircraft carriers decided the battle without surface ships ever exchanging fire. In many cases, the armor worked exactly as designed. It stopped shells. It slowed flooding. It saved lives. But it could not stop a form of warfare that bypassed it entirely. The battleship was no longer the master of its environment. Battleship armor did not fail. It reached the limits of what steel could do in a world where war moved faster than steel could evolve. And when war no longer came from the horizon, but from the sky and beneath the sea, armor alone was no longer enough. From the gun decks to the bridge, every story we tell honors those who served. If this tale made you feel the salt and steel of history, give it a like, and if you're not yet part of our channel's convoy, subscribe and join the ranks, more powerful stories await.